Now, I've shared some of my reminiscences, and some of these things are sort of pivotal parts of my life. There's some other things that occurred that I just wanted to share with you, trying to be brief here. When I was then in Toronto in fifth grade, a friend of mine, Alius Chesekas, uh, who was a little bit of, of a truant problem, um, because the parents wanted to keep him off the streets during the summer, enrolled him in an art class. And that's when I would visit him, and I'd see him take a blank canvas and step by step gradually transform it into a beautiful work of art. That's where my desire for of art came from, the seed of art. It was only 10 years later that it started to actually blossom and then never stopped blossoming. But it's because of, a, it, it, because of my friend, my best friend, and the artwork that he did that I continued to do artwork. Seventh grade, we're already in Rockford, Illinois. The family moved uh, just 100 miles west of here. And I was in a junior high school, Roosevelt Junior High School. And, this, and the educational program was different. You go from class to class, and the different teachers have different subjects that they teach. And the science teacher just mesmerized me. I just couldn't get over the world and what, how it works. And all aspects of science became interesting to me. So I said, when I finished seventh grade, whenever anybody asked, what are you going to do when you grow up? Well, no longer was it going to be policeman or cowboy. I'm going to be a scientist. And then during high school, it became clarified, because what I really wanted to do is to understand everything around us. What is this podium made of? And how does it stay together? Basically, atomic physics. And that's why I ended up at the University of Chicago, the premier, one of the premier uh, physics institutions. Uh, in the world then as it is now. The, the next transformative event that I'm recollecting about was in my second year of college. Um, I would, despite my own protests, I was forced to take biology. Now, I want to do atomic physics, not worry about frogs and lizards and salamanders. And I couldn't understand this, this, this requirement, but it was, I couldn't get the administration to see my way. So I ended up in a class very unhappily but the teacher was very, very energetic, very charismatic, young fellow, just finished his education, and, and very interesting classes. And when he got to the nervous system, how these neurons, these cells with long projections and uh, dendrites and other projections, axons, and their interconnections and their networks that they have, these, uh, an ensemble of them, make us. That's where our thinking comes from. That's where our personalities come from, our consciousness, our beings, our morality. Our religion comes from that, from this ensemble. How does that happen? Now, you know, the, the questions of physics were, didn't disappear. I still was interested in that, and I still am. But this became more important, more interesting. And that's when the road to neurology, neurobiology took place, and the big shift to, to neurosciences and neurology. That teacher uh, who affected me so much, Richard Mintel, he's right here. So uh, we want to thank him. These are some pivotal points in my life. Everyone here in this room has had pivotal points in their lives, too. Okay? And I've shared some of my, mem my memories. Okay? Tomorrow, uh, when you wake up, hopefully you'll have a lot of memories about today's events, this evening's events. Uh, you'll remember who you met, who you talked to, what the conversations were about, what you had for dinner, uh, how, how the music went, on and on. A massive amount of memories just from one evening, and everyone's going to have them. We have 100 billion neurons in our heads. You know, each of them have 100,000 connections, trillions of synapses. Where are these memories? Where are they? Where are they located? We're not growing new neurons tonight, I assure you. We're not going to produce one new synapse at all. If you don't overdo the alcohol, you won't kill a moth, okay? <laughs> so don't overdo it. It's not happening. So where is the memories? Well, the theories are, Changes in synaptic connectivity. That's where all the evidence. Certainly, synapses are very important. There's no doubt about it. Neurotransmitters. But the question is, is that sufficient? You know, trillions of synapses? Well, listen, now that used to be a gigantic number. Now we have the U.S. debt to deal with, European <laughs> debt to deal with. Now a trillion dollars is a congressman's pocket change. It doesn't seem so big anymore. Is that really enough in our nervous systems to account for all our memories? Not only tomorrow we're going to remember what happened this evening, but we have an entire life of memories that we remember. Where are they? Are these changes in synaptic plasticity sufficient to account for all our memories? Well, now I'm going to get into total speculation the rest of my talk. 
My speculation is that it's not, that we have to look at other aspects, other depths, other dimensions. And we are now jumping straight into physics and atomic physics. Maybe we have to look at the quantum level, at the atomic level. And in terms of uh, the quantum and quantum mechanics, there's a IBM and Hewlett Packard and all the majors are working to try and develop new computer technology, quantum computers, which are using the storage of information at that level. Okay, now, so, so that is an area of active investigation, which increase computer capacity massively. Now, quantum mechanics is a rather strange science, and many aspects of it are very, very spooky and very, very strange, and not part of our lives, but it's real. Um, Albert Einstein, whom you know, uh, was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And then as it evolved, he became very unhappy with many of the predictions. He did not like the spookiness that was predicted. And that's his word. He, and he worked the rest of his career to, to get rid of the spookiness. He couldn't because it's there and it's part of everything in, in our lives. It's on the, at, the, at the atomic level, the spook, pure spookiness. And if you'd like to get some experience of what this looks like, Brian Green is a physicist at Columbia University. He just recently finished up a program, PBS on NOVA, four-part series, and that program was about a month ago, um, about, about the fabric of the cosmos. I recommend you to take a see it. The visuals are fantastic, it's very entertaining. And in the third part about the quantum mechanics, you'll see an awful lot of strange visual effects. And those visual effects are not some creativity of artists. They're actually what happens in the quantum world, so I recommend that. Now, that's the one area we may be able to you know, have some memory storage. What about going down deeper, farther, farther down, into the ultimate of the small, and we're getting down into strings, the string theory, which is a very active area of research in physics right now. These strings that everything is composed of vibrate, but they vibrate in our space, but they vibrate in at least eight other dimensions, so they connect into other space, other, other dimensional states. Where are these dimensions? Some, some people think they're coiled up, little points all over the place. Other people, like Lisa Randall, a physicist at Harvard University, thinks that these dimensions are everywhere. We're just walking through them, and that eight plus dimensions are here. There may be other universes. There may be other Balzacus museums in these other dimensional states that we're just walking through. They're walking through us, we're walking through them, and that the only interaction is through these strings and the vibration of these strings. So that, uh, so that maybe it's at that level. These are pure speculations, but I think it's an opportunity to combine aspects of art, physics, neurology, neurobiology together. So that's an area of investigation that I'm undertaking right now, and, um, and a, series, a current series of works called Quantum, uh, Quantized Chromodynamics that's going to be premiering at the Lubeznik Art Center in Michigan City in January, the art exhibit I'll be having out there. So now I've gone full, full circle. Art, neurology, neurobiology, and the physics, and trying to incorporate everything together. So again, I want to thank all of you tonight for coming. It's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you for your support of the museum, for the Hope and Spirit Project. And I specifically want to thank one dear, dear person here who has been my support for over 21 years and has helped me out over all these years of very, very much difficulty and times of trouble and has been so kind to me. My dear wife, Sigita.